On the heels of a doomed console, it was a really crucial time for Sega. The dream was born. And they really wanted to get back into the race, so they put out the Dreamcast. It survived an executive shakeup. So we had a parting of the ways, and I left the company. And saved a company. Retailers started calling us in week two and three saying, we're out of stock, we're out of stock, we have to have more hardware, people are banging down our doors. But the dream was short-lived. And then it just stopped. I mean, it was just silent. Dreamcasts sat on store shelves. This is the story of the Sega Dreamcast. Here is a system that was ahead of its time. In November of 1994, Sega launches its Sega Saturn in Japan. At the time of conception, it was going to be basically just a really souped up 2D machine. With a little bit of hardware devoted to 3D. And once the PlayStation announced their specs and it was going to be this full 3D machine, I think they went in there and kind of retooled it in a hurry. And it probably wasn't as efficient or as powerful as it probably should have been. Ha <laughs> ha! So you made it this far, huh? It actually went quite well in Japan, and Saturn had a long lifespan in Japan. Thanks to strong arcade ports like Sega's Virtua Fighter series, the Saturn sells 5.8 million units in three years. In Japan, Virtua Fighter is a phenomenon. <laughs> Beyond anything we could even compare it to in the United States, I mean, nothing compares to how big it is there. And the idea of bringing that home and being able to play was a very bold intelligent move on their part. In Japan at this point, the arcades were still hot. The arcades have been dead for 10 years here in America, but in Japan, having an arcade hit meant something. So Saturn had an arcade hit. The Saturn does not catch on outside of Japan and is quickly eclipsed by Sony's PlayStation. The Saturn launched before PlayStation, I believe in the summer of 1995, which was the wrong time to launch. Also at a very expensive price point. I believe it launched at $399 versus $299 and did not have very good games. Mm. We're not that fun to play. And as we all know, if you want to play a game, you want to have fun. They were looking to be like this kind of hardcore gamers machine with these ports of the arcade games where the Sony came in with a completely different approach. You know, they wanted this to be a games machine for everybody and they kind of really shifted the perception of everybody, of the consumers, towards what a game machine is. I think for the people who purchased Saturn, uh, they were quite satisfied with the games that they got. There were some wonderful gameplay experiences available on the Saturn that weren't available elsewhere, so it was a purchase that ended up being of value to consumers. If people were purchasing Saturn because they felt like they could get 10 years worth of gameplay out of it with sufficient gameplay innovation over that period of time, I would say those people were probably disappointed. The Sega Saturn was very successful with the hardcore gamer crowd, and with the broader range of crowd, it wasn't quite as popular, but it was still a major name. Sega was in a really, really tough position in that they had extended themselves, they had overextended themselves. There was a time prior to Dreamcast, just prior to Dreamcast, really, as Saturn was coming out, where Sega had the Saturn. In parts of the world, they were still selling the Master System. They had Pico, they had 32X, they had Genesis, they had Game Gear, they had Nomad. So yeah, that's seven systems concurrently. They had really gotten themselves into a rut. They had completely botched the Saturn launch in North America. I believe if we look at Saturn, it was a system that shouldn't have been launched. It was too difficult to develop for, therefore the games were not fun and the games weren't there. This is not about hardware. This is about software. Software has always driven hardware. If you don't have the software, the hardware will fail. Saturn's failure causes Sega to lose $267.9 million and lay off 30% of its workforce. There was all of a sudden a couple of years where they didn't have any kind of a console at all. And since Sega was very much a, a hardware-specific company, that was a very big problem. 
Sega's solution is to begin work on a brand new console, and this time, the Japanese gaming giant is determined to learn from its past mistakes. Well, we really had to reestablish ourselves as a company with all the retailers and gain the consumer confidence back because of the failures that Sega had. Sega hopes to win back the consumer confidence it had lost and prepares a surprise announcement for E3 in 1998. Then they had a few closed door meetings. You had to sign your life away on this NDA. You, at, at pain of death, you could not tell people what you saw for months. By the second or third day of the show, I'd forgotten all about those little NDA thingies, those non-disclosure agreements that I had signed. I needed to write something for MSNBC about what I had seen at the show, and so I wrote all about this great demonstration I had of Dreamcast behind closed doors. And then I woke up at 6 in the morning and realized what I had done and called MSNBC and said, no, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off, please. And they took it off, and of course, Sega was furious. They were livid. The happy ending to the story was that, that my ratings on that particular article were so bad that Sega no longer cared. <laughs> but it, it, Granted, it only ran for three hours. Codenamed the Katana. This new system would later be known as the Dreamcast. I was completely excited at the prospect of a next generation platform from Sega because it was clear that we uh, had struggled with Saturn. The Sega Saturn was a miserable failure for Sega and they really wanted to get back into the race. So they put out the Dreamcast way before any of these next generation systems came out. But would gamers trust Sega after all of their past failures? Definitely what Sega was trying to incorporate into the Dreamcast, what they learned from the Saturn, was a, a broader audience. They were trying to make it a gamer machine for everybody. I mean, they were really trying to shift gears there. It was a really crucial time for Sega. But it was also clear that the company had every intent of rejoining the battle, and we were all ready to rejoin the battle. On November 27th, 1998, the Dreamcast is made a reality to the Japanese gaming public. One of the key events for all game consoles is the Japanese launch. Japanese launches up to this point were something big. I mean, really big. The Japanese government requested companies to not launch their game systems during weekdays because it cut down on national productivity. Trains would be slowed down as they'd go by Akihabara, which is the electric town in Tokyo. Japanese people loved good graphics. At that time, Dreamcast was very great graphics, so everyone was excited about it. But the launch is not without its problems. Due to manufacturing glitches, Sega fails to meet shipping goals for the console. So with, with Dreamcast, they, they missed their first window of opportunity because NEC was making their, their graphics chip and there weren't enough available for a full launch. So a lot of people left stores empty-handed. The image of the time of the Sega Dreamcast, I think, with the Japanese public was, looks like maybe Sega's turning over a new leaf. It's kind of a, it was a new feeling for Sega, I think, and they really had a, a successful job of arousing interest in the public and showing that they were maybe ready to start something really strong here. It was Sega's next big console after the Sega Saturn. The Sega Saturn was a miserable failure for Sega, and they really wanted to get back into the race. So they put out the Dreamcast way before any of these next generation systems came out. With the US launch still more than a year away, Sega president Bernie Stoller takes note of the mistakes made by his Japanese partners. And I was interested in rebuilding Sega, reestablishing the strength that it once had, both in software and hardware, and rebuild a team that became a world-class team to help drive an organization. And that's what I wanted to do, and I believe that the team did that. It's not about one individual, it's about a team. What I can say about Bernie Stoller is that he did a lot of things really, really right. You compare the Japanese launch of Dreamcast to the US launch of Dreamcast, and Bernie had the publicity in place, he had the enthusiasts really rallied so that they were excited. While Sega is poised to take the US by storm, Sony is set to shake out the video game world. At every moment with Dreamcast, it was always kind of threatened by the looming shadow of this unshown thing. The, the, the shadow of PlayStation 2 always loomed large over it. 
みんな最初は一緒に。At the beginning, everyone was very excited and behind the Sega Dreamcast, but as time went on, more and more focus shifted towards the PlayStation 2. Then, as early as March in 1999, just really a couple of months later, Ken Kutaragi unveiled PlayStation 2. And it was so much more powerful than Dreamcast, and it could do so much more than Dreamcast. Sony, frankly, was very effective in holding out that promise to gamers. I think to a certain extent they succeeded in convincing their existing PlayStation 1 audience not to get a Dreamcast and to wait until this mythical new system was going to appear. The Dreamcast excites American gamers with pre orders for the console reaching 300,000, shattering the record of 100,000 set by the PlayStation in 1995. We really had to reestablish ourselves as a company and gain the consumer confidence back. And they were very, very aggressive. Pushing the whole idea of Dreamcast. There was a lot of excitement about the Sega name at that point. Less than one month before the launch of the Dreamcast, the team at Sega is dealt an unexpected blow. Right before the day itself, Bernie was fired from Sega. I didn't agree with who was there that then became my boss, Mr. Okawa. So、um, we had a parting of the ways, and I left the company.、Uh, it was unfortunate, but the team that I had built and the team that had really helped build the launch, they were in place. They were ready to go. They were ready to drive the product. And they did. The Dreamcast juggernaut could not be derailed, and the system launched in the U.S. on September 9th, 1999, for $199. I think what made the Dreamcast is so great,、uh, are really the games. Right from launch, it had a couple really great games. It had Soul Calibur, <laughs> Sonic Adventure was really popular. It had great football games with、uh, Sega's NFL 2K series. There's the snap. Far passing for the score. And he's in for the score. One of the other things that made the Dreamcast so great is the online feature. Out of the box, this came with a modem, this system. Immediately, you could be getting on and, and playing against other people across the country, and that was a real novelty back then. Just four days after the U.S. launch, Sega reports selling 372,000 Dreamcasts and bringing in over $132 million. The launch was successful. Sega was successful, and it regained the confidence of both the retail community and the consumer. We knew the Dreamcast was a tremendously successful launch when retailers started calling us in week two and three, saying, "We're out of stock. We're out of stock. We have to have more hardware. We have to have hardware." People are banging down our doors. Sega tried to do all the things that they had done wrong with Saturn, right with Dreamcast. Saturn was very miserable to program. Dreamcast was a snap to program. Saturn had a very old-fashioned controller. It was really just a Genesis controller, still with the kidney bean shape. Dreamcast had a newfangled controller. They really looked and tried to do everything different, and that side of things was really good. But would it be good enough to hold off the PlayStation 2? On October 26th of 2000, the heavily hyped PlayStation 2 is unleashed on the masses. The first year of PlayStation 2, the, the biggest hit on PlayStation 2 was Matrix. People were watching the movie; they weren't playing the game. PlayStation 2 sparked the DVD market in Japan. DVD hadn't caught on in Japan, and before PlayStation 2, you'd walk through Akihabara and there'd be game stores every place. After PlayStation 2, you'd walk through Akihabara and you'd see DVD stores. And if you walked into these DVD stores, they were demonstrating movies using PlayStation 2. The Dreamcast would have been a, a bigger player, in my opinion, had it had a, Dream, a DVD player installed from the get-go. Sega looked over its shoulder, and they realized they had lost Japan. There was no resurrecting Japan. They might have been able to hold Japan if they'd had a DVD player in there. Because you know, in the early days for for PlayStation 2, PlayStation 2 was the cheapest DVD player in Japan. 
And if they had had that distinction, they might have been able to hold on. PlayStation 2 sales hit $165 million in its first three days. And the Dreamcast suffers. I mean, it was just silent. Dreamcast sat on store shelves. No games would did that well again. Even good games just kind of sat there and people took them, but it was just somebody turned off the light. It was a big hit with gamers, but unfortunately it wasn't really, you know, commercially viable. It came in at a sort of awkward time and right before the release of the PlayStation 2. So unfortunately it didn't sort of build the uh, fan base that it could have. Sega, you've got to understand, is hemorrhaging money as a company. They realized that if they could sell four to five million units worldwide, that they could still have a profitable market. They could last a little longer. Sega catches a break in December of 2000 when Sony can only ship half as many PS2s as it planned for the holiday season. We had a crew of people who were very um, uh, into being the underdog. I'll allow you to die like a warrior. Oddly enough, becoming the underdog almost galvanized us further. It really brought us together as a team because we knew exactly what we had to do. And they thought, you know, we drop our price, we come out aggressive with all kinds of things, including you could have a free Dreamcast. And it wasn't enough. They, they pushed, they pushed, they pushed. And at the end of Christmas, they hadn't made headway. What are you saying? Rumors started coming out that Sega was no longer manufacturing Dreamcast. No! And I remember interviewing Charlie Belfield. I said, the rumor is that you're going to discontinue. And he said, no, that's not true. And I said, are you manufacturing them now? And he said, no. And I said, how much inventory do you have? And it turned out that there was more inventory in the channel and in their warehouses than there was sold. And I said, OK, that doesn't look good. Charlie, when will you start manufacturing again? And that was when Charlie said, you know, we have no plan to start manufacturing again. And that was when, that was the first time Sega came out and officially announced that, yeah, we're, we've discontinued. It was a real crush to the egos of everybody. I mean, I, I remember I was in the meeting where we were told that the Dreamcast was not going to continue. And everyone just was silent. Everyone was just speechless. You know, no one said a thing. It was just very heavy, very oppressive. I don't know that Sega could have done anything differently to really save the Dreamcast. The biggest nail in their coffin was Sony really pushing the PlayStation 2. To the delight of gamers around the world, Sega announces that they are going to create games for all consoles. I think it was a time where Sega really had to address itself and say, are we going to now just be a software company? And if we are going to be a software company, is the team that we have here going to be one of the best organizations to build great software? Because that's going to have to be our focus. Come on, let's begin. And that's going to have to be our drive. And that's how we're going to be able to survive. Go! Oh. Oh. So when Sega said that they would no longer be hardware-specific, there was a lot of excitement. They really were the bell of the ball. Microsoft, for their Xbox console, got Sega to promise them Panzer Dragoon, a beautiful game. But Sony turned around, and they had the Virtua Fighter series locked up for themselves. Huh. You know, that was the arcade hit, and that was the bigger seller. Especially in Japan, that was a big seller. Virtua Tennis. There was a very committed Sega fan base right up till the end of Dreamcast that very much appreciated the Sega style of gameplay. As we transitioned from a hardware company pushing the Dreamcast platform to a software developer, we were able to successfully convert the Sega fan base to other hardware platforms via our games. We were able to explain to gamers, yeah, you can still have your Jet Grind radio, but it's just going to happen on these other platforms. But we promise you, it'll be the same exact wonderful gameplay experience. And Sega gamers came along with us. But the Dreamcast will live on in gamers' hearts and memories.
If you picked up a Dreamcast, you were holding something that felt like a gamer's machine. It felt like it was made for games. Without a doubt, the Dreamcast showed the world that online gaming was possible and fun and interesting on console. So there's no question with respect to online gameplay, Dreamcast will be remembered for ever. Dreamcast was something special, uh, mostly because, uh, you know, it came from Sega. So the games that really were released with it, especially at the beginning, were some of the best games of the last generation, or even this one. I've been in this industry a long time. I've seen a lot of hardware companies come and go. Dreamcast will always have a position in this industry from a historic standpoint. Because it did so well in the first two years that it was there, it really established itself. Here is a system that was ahead of its time. People who owned a Dreamcast in 2000 and 2001 were probably a lot happier than people who owned a PlayStation 2. Because there were a lot of great games for Dreamcast. I think that it will go down in history as one of the more desirable systems. It all started with Easter eggs. Before you know it, I couldn't get enough of God mode. When I don't punch him in, I, I get a little weak. I thought you were supposed to go backwards and pitfall. I can't even make it through two levels without infinite ammo. I can't remember a time when I didn't use codes. They made up the codes, I just used them. No one's gonna find out. <sighs> get the latest cheat codes and walk through strategies for Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Right, so homie, let's see if you got what it takes. Cheat season premiere, January 18th at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific.